Hi everybody, welcome to AI for the Average Joe episode four. Today we've got Ross Stevenson with us um, for share, Steal These Thoughts, not Share These Thoughts, Steal These Thoughts. Super excited to be talking about the evolution and where we are in AI. Things are moving so quickly and we've also got a fantastic report, uh, The State of AI in L&D 2003, which Ross has created. We're going to explore some key takeaways of that today. Hey Ross, how are you doing? Hey, I'm very well, thank you, and thank you thank for having me. You. No, you're very welcome. It's great to have you here. So do you want to kind of give us a bit of an overview of the stuff that you've been doing, um, particularly around this mm. report? Because I think people are going to find mm. this really interesting. Mm. Yeah, definitely. So I should probably set some context there. I'm not an AI guru <laughs> or anything like that. I'm literally just a, an L&D guy, been in the industry for 15 years. Um, yep. I'm an absolute tech nerd. So obviously AI comes up. I'm very interested around that. I've spent the last year like submerge in the matrix, I say to people um, from speaking with different teams, different organizations, uh, even kind of before the generative AI boom from end of last year, just because I find it very fascinating. And the report came around because as an L&D person, I was really struggling to kind of get specific data in the L&D industry to say, how do people really feel about this new technology? And what do they know about it right now? And that's purely because, and I'm sure both of you might identify with this in the LED industry, it's pretty slow to adapt and also to adopt new technology. So with this kind of, I don't want to call it the kind of fourth revolution that some people are, but kind of this big kind of bit of tech coming out, it was like, well, how do people really feel? And then off the base of that, how can I, as someone who I kind of see myself as a bit of an experimentalist, how can I then get into that conversation and talk to people and really that's where the kind of report came around was just to get that information and then share it with other people because I think they're definitely in this field right now with AI in particular there's a, so many opinions and there's opinions left right and center of whether you know Terminator 2 is going to happen next week or we're going to be working with robots and it's going to be a lovely place so I just really want to get some data to say well how do we feel what do we know and what can we take from that? So that is, yeah, how the report came around. So at the time of us speaking, it's been out um, for about a week. I think it's had like 500 downloads, which is great. So, um, you know, people are evidently interested, which is good. And like I say, it's a free resource there for people just to pick up and hopefully give them at least at this moment in time, because this moves so fast, some real data that they can take away and go, okay, so how is my industry looking at this? And what can I do with this data? It's interesting what you're saying there as well, Ross, because this is, it's change, isn't it, this ultimately? So when you talk about diff so many differing opinions, a lot of that is actually so many different responses to change mm. um, because you're going to have people that are just, yeah, let's, let's go, there's opportunity mm. here. And then other people who maybe are like, oh, no, that this plays in too much to what I do already and I'm not willing yeah. to, to open that door. So it's really interesting. I think throughout this podcast, for me, I feel like it's inspiring me more to have a go mm. and mm. use it as a tool rather than mm. to replace anything. It's just a great tool to avoid some of that procrastination or time spent mm. gathering information that we maybe don't need to be there so um yeah really really great and, and a really interesting read of the report as well mm. no great I mean it's it's great to have that mindset you know because it's it is funny I think people sit in either of those camps where I can't remember exactly what I wrote but it was over like you you love the matrix and you want to be in it or you're kind of sitting there scared about Arnold Schwarzenegger kind of kicking your door down whereas there's kind of that middle bit where, you know, we have to respect risks with anything, you know, life is risk, really. Yeah. Um, well, that's a pretty morbid thing to say, but in, in general, well, that kind of is what it's like. And then, but there's also opportunity there as well. And, and to your point, I think it's just curiosity because realistically, mm. you know, we don't, we don't all have the answers. Like we're all just experimenting with it. Um, and you know, I've said this before where I might be just three or four months ahead of the journey than other people and people behind are just kind of getting that. And there's people who are ahead of me that I'm learning from and then kind of bringing that into my workflow and seeing how does that work? And I think to your point, one of the things I find very interesting at the moment is that I think there's some linear thinking on just content creation. People are so focused on mm. just that, but it's kind of like saying we're only using 5% of the tool or actually I think the unlock is beyond the content creation and it's like to what you're alluding to, how do I then use that to help me in the processes that I've already got? You know, the admin stuff, which is really mundane and takes up so much time or editing, 
and even just having a thought partner because a lot of the times if you're you know if you're a solo L D person which a lot of people are in organizations they haven't got people to bounce ideas off of so although it sounds weird to say go and talk to a robot it's you know it's a good option to have if it's been trained on the world's data to a certain point to say you know from your library what do you think of x y and z and how can that spark ideas so i think there is a lot in that I, the reason why i've got into this is because i kind of want people to think beyond the content creation think beyond the five percent and like mm. hey you know what else you know what else could it do for you mm, love that love that so ross give us your two top takeaways from the research i know you've got about 130 yeah. people that responded to your serving yeah. and your questions what's your two top takeaways that you want to share I mean, that's a good question. I'm going to cheat here because I'm actually looking at it as we talk to remind myself. Hey, stick it on the screen. There's a lot in there. That's quite a big question, isn't it? I've been building it for so long. Like, I just become sick of it at a point. I'm like, right, I've enough of it now. I don't want to look at it. I've built it. I've left it. I've I've kind of moved on. I'm one of those people. But I think the first thing obviously has to be the, the, the first one, which was rating people's understanding of artificial intelligence. And the reason why I say that is because there's a big umbrella of what artificial intelligence means. And then mm. the tools we're talking about now are generative artificial intelligence or what is called large language models. So they're a subset of artificial intelligence. I think of most things that sometimes gets confused and just kind of using, it's easy to say AI and it's kind of a blanket for it. But, you know, when we talk about chat GPT, when we talk about, you know, Microsoft Copilot and these other tools, they are generative tools. So they are creating new content. They are trained on data. It's a large language model that you are interacting with through a conversation. So it's a certain subset of artificial intelligence. And there's obviously, of course, this other, I think someone described it to me the other day, who's far smarter than I, about species of artificial intelligence. And that wow. effectively what we're going to have is a ecosystem of different species of artificial intelligence. And we're kind of, you know, generative AI is probably the first consumer facing one that we've been able to access as a majority in society. Whereas artificial intelligence in general has been around since 1956 when it was first coined in this paper um, in America. And it's been the back end operation of all the things we do, you know, streaming services, subscription services, you know, Tesco shop, mm. getting stuff recommended to you. That's all artificial intelligence mm. and machine learning. So it's just a different application. Yeah. But what I found is in that report, so, you know, 64% of those people that responded mm. basically said, their understanding of AI Let's needs work. Let's flash it up so we can see. I think that's yeah, a great shout. There you go. Go for it. Oh, lovely. You've come prepared unlike I. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so you've got 64% of people basically said it needs work, which is really interesting because if we use that as the base or kind mm. of build in our house to understand AI, I mean, that's really where we need to kind of start is, you know, how do we get people to understand at a very foundational level? And this is where a lot of my work focuses on because like I said, I'm not, you know, an AI expert, I'm just a normal guy figuring this stuff out. How do I explain that um, to other people? So it's getting that clear basis of, you know, what is artificial intelligence? How does it work? What systems does it sit in? And what is generative artificial intelligence? Do you think, and I'm just going to pop this out there, Ross, do you think people want to understand it? Or do you want to know, do you think they want to know what's in it for them? Both. Well, I would say the second part is what they want. They want to know what's in it for them versus how it actually works. And mm. I think that's sometimes the the pitfall where the doom and gloom comes out, because as humans, you know, we're biologically programmed to survive. So we're mm. always looking to understand what is the threat on the savannah that we need to be away from or we need to be running away from. And actually, I find a lot of times where it's more about if you can understand more of what is causing that fear then generally you know we find that's what's going to help us but i would agree your point i think the second part of that is they just want to know what's in it for them mm -hmm. realistically um but then i think you know if you really want to i don't sound biased here because i've been sitting in this world for a, over a year now really but i think if you really want to maximize it you can't go wrong without finding out what it does because then it kind of opens up so many doors to say to our point earlier on you've got more curiosity you yeah. think more about opportunities and I think there's a bit more calm and I find with people that if they understand it a bit more they do feel a bit more open to oh okay so if this is how it works then I can start to understand the applications there I think with anything there's always fear in I don't understand how this thing works so I'm just going to either ignore it or you know rally against it to say 
it's an evil um, that we can't use. And I think, you know, I wrote something not too long ago about other technologies that terrified people. Oh, and I then, saw like, your post about the calculator, yeah, yeah. for example. And it was like the calculator. Teachers, yeah, <laughs> like teachers that. were right. They, were like, they <laughs> were like, hey, you know, the calculator is going to be the end of the world. Like our economic system is going to fall apart because people use a calculator. And it was the same with books. But I look at AI is in the same space of it is a tool to help us maximize and bring back time to us to hopefully be more creative. But I think you only get there if you have that understanding. And yeah. I think, as we've said, they, too many people go to what's in it for me. You know, like, I love some of these YouTube videos are hilarious where it's like own 500 pound a day or chat GPT or all this rubbish. I'm like, well, that's the kind of like, how do I exploit this versus how do I maximize this in my work? So yeah, I, honestly, I would love to see more people go down the understanding route. Um, but I'm also a realist in the fact that maybe that's not going to be the case, right? And it's literally think, just going to be, tell me. Yeah, and I think people will understand once they've bought into it. And I think mm. there's a mindset shift here prior to the skill set and knowledge shift. And that's, mm. um, you know, that's part of this journey, mm. which is because actually, even if by doing these podcasts, we can just get some people excited about it mm. and start thinking about the what's in it for me. Mm -hmm then the next the rest will come um mm. so it doesn't feel just too overwhelming so i think yeah. you know it's, it's interesting to see where people are at with this for sure at the moment mm. Mm. yeah i thought mm. this this confidence piece was interesting as well it was what well, what you know i thought you know sometimes my somewhat could be different to your somewhat but that was quite a mm. high score that we felt that came through on this report in regards to confidence because you've yeah. got understanding which is wavering a little bit but then confidence which was you know it feels high high yeah what do it's you interesting think? yeah it's interesting because the funny thing is the data you could you could it two ways because you could also flip it and then say not confident and somewhat confident in the same bucket and then say actually people oh, okay. aren't as common opposite so it's one of those weird things i was looking at it it was like i could tell two different stories mm -hmm. but i kind of wanted to tell a more positive story by say i suppose it'd be <laughs> like oh but i think maybe that just leans into i, I mean i'm making an assumption here is that because in the L&D industry, you know, I'm hoping many people are curious and feel confident in acquiring new skills and taking mm. time to understand stuff. Mm. So although there is that I don't understand this, but it kind of feels like there's a confidence to be like, yeah, but I probably could do it because there's all this other stuff that, you know, over the last 50 years, well, let's, let's be more specific over the last 20 years of digital technology innovation that's coming of all these different tools you know we've all adapted to them over time zoom team slack powerpoint word etc you know so i think there's probably stuff there that people are looking at and going yeah i don't know but i feel confident enough to be let's crack in and uh, mm -hmm. see what we can okay. do that's my hope that's interesting anyway. yeah that's hope yeah the hope <laughs> leading the way as it yeah. were that or they just lied they were just like hey i'm just i'm confident like but, you know, <laughs> i'm not a company so there's no pushback on that to be like oh my god i'm going to share this with your company they're going to find oh, out okay, that's interesting. you don't know that yeah, yeah. absolutely and just, and just thinking there ross just to kind of move on into that practical you know takeaway for people today mm. you've mentioned about sort of stretching that five percent of using mm. this as just for content creation so yeah do you have any examples of the kind of prompts or things that people can be putting into chat gpt to be able to access some of that stuff yeah definitely so let me um let me share my screen awesome. and then uh and then we can take a look at that you might have to bear with me because about five screens in front of me because <laughs> i got all my tabs <laughs> open <laughs> i am one of those people <laughs> okay so right hopefully you can see my screen now yeah. on the yeah, lovely chat gpt so i will preface that i have chat gpt plus because i'm a nerd so i pay the money to get the extra <laughs> on um the only difference is and actually it's not a massive difference if you're just a general user at all i can just switch between 3.5 and 4 you still get four um access as a free user but it's kind of limited to certain bits on this well i'll preface that because there'll always be someone going but i haven't got the paid for version so I can't do this. it's not true these, you can these do these prompts will still you know they'll still work yeah. yeah this is all exactly. basically yeah this is all fundamentally the kind of theory um behind it so what i would say is that before any interaction with kind of generative ai tools i think it's really clear to think about the structure of how they work and what they need because some people kind of think it's a mind reader and it's like with Google, right? You go on Google and you type in banana bread recipe and Google goes, here's 10 million different articles for a banana bread recipe. They treat generative AI the same. And then it goes, 
I don't know what you want. What does that mean? Banana bread recipe? Do you want me to give you a picture? Do you want me to give you a line about something? Do you want me to give you a description? So there's three things that you need for your prompts to do well. And I'd always say to people, you know, think about that before you interact with them, which is you need to give it specificity. So it needs to know what role is it playing? What do you want to talk about specifically? It needs to have context. So you might have the context in your head on the project you're working on, but ChatGPT doesn't. So you need to give it as much as you can without giving any industry secrets or stuff like that. How can you give it context to say, this is what I'm working on. This is the context you need to know in order to help me with the task. And then the last one is around constraints. And constraints is really around, you've got to think about this is a huge database. So it can go in 10 million different directions. If you don't give it constraints and say, right, so I've been really specific on the role you play and I've given you context to say what that means for you. I now am using constraints to say, what are you going to help me with? So we can do um, a live example of this. Right. So let's yeah. say, for example, I'm just going to keep this very kind of basic for the purpose of this demo and say, uh, you know, you are an LND manager. And then we can just say, you know, you work in a high profile corporate organization with 5,000 employees and you want to discover their thoughts on L&D products today. Mm -hmm. So really characterizing this to yeah. make ChatGPT put, yeah. put ChatGPT into the shoes of who you want them to respond from. hundred percent, a hundred percent. And the way I liken it is to imagine you have an intern on your team, right? And you've got someone that's coming to the business and they don't know what they don't know. They have no understanding of the culture of the organization, what's happening in your team. And you kind of do a similar thing, right? If you were asking an intern to take on a task, you would walk them through and say, well, what does this role do? Mm -hmm. And then what are the specific attributes you need to know about in our organization today? And then what am I looking for you to do? And then just as with ChatGPT, I look for an intern to basically give me what I call a ugly first draft. And that is actually something I stole from um, an incredible marketer called Anne Hadley, who wrote a book called Everyone Writes, which is an amazing book. And basically the ugly first draft is kind of what I look at as ChatGPT gives out. And that is to say that you know, it can do 70% of the work for you, but you mm. always need 30% of that human interactivity. And you'll see on this here, right? Because if we really want to get into getting a picture perfect kind of output, it takes time. Like you'll be sitting there talking to it 15, 20 minutes. And mm -hmm. I think this is where people start to drop off because what they expect is instant gratification. They expect mm. instantly you're going to give me what I want. But then again, if we go back to the intern kind of analogy, you wouldn't get that from that individual. They might get you some research, you'd work with them to give them feedback and say, okay, that works, that doesn't work. How can we do that? Mm. Um, so yeah, so if we look at this here. So what we've said already is we've been specific. So we're saying you're an NND manager. We've given some context in terms of saying you work in a high profile corporate organization, you've got 5,000 employees and you want to discover their thoughts on LND products today. So then what we would say for constraints is, so we would say, I need your help in designing a survey to gather thoughts and feelings on our L&D products. Well, is there a reason you're being very nice to it? I mm. need your help mm. in designing. Is there mm. a reason you've written it that way rather than design a survey, being a bit more abrupt with it? Is there any science in that? Or is it you just being, you just it's just being me nice? Being nice yeah. <laughs> but it's me being incredibly British and going, please help me do this. Sometimes I say thanks to it. Sometimes I say, please. I'm just, I feel so guilty. I'm like, oh my God, please do this. So it's can... really polite back though, isn't it? So you can, it, can, it can do, apologize, a bard apologize to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah it I can, it, it can do that. Yeah. yeah, it can do that. So yeah, that's just uh, me. I mean, if you want to be nasty to me, I mean, you know, go for it. But I just <laughs> feel incredibly guilty um, to actually do that. But I mean, when you get to, so there's a good point on there is that if you're not getting the response that you want you can then start to be incredibly instructive and i think okay. the reason why i don't do that with the first kind of starting off of the conversation is it's just kind of like setting the scene and then once i get some responses you know usually i have the one-liners of take that away 
add this in why do you oh, keep giving okay. me this like, i don't understand why you keep giving me this and then it starts going i'm so sorry please don't you know <laughs> please don't stop using me <laughs> yeah please don't come back i'm so um, sorry <laughs> exactly yeah yeah so for the constraints here what i've said is i need your help in designing a survey to gather thoughts and feelings on our edit lnd products and what i'll say is um you know please present this in a bullet point format oh, okay so you're, you're okay. dictating how you want the outcome yeah, 100%, to be nice 100 percent. yeah so love it uh, uh, so yeah please present this in bullet point format and make sure it is clear concise and short for the user to nice. complete so you can do that like you know you can do whatever you want really at the beginning but it just gives it some mm. real clear constraints to be like don't just go off and write me war and mm. peace um you know give me that and then we can start to work for it from there so we recap so on that so, so I guess it. you could just just to build on this and I guess you yeah. could dictate what you wanted the headers to be or what some of the questions to cover or so if you wanted to go into that level of detail yeah. or would that be the next step you could do that you could do that if you've already okay. got that um I'm just kind of taking this as a blank slate but if you've already yeah. got let's say an employee engagement survey that you're using or a learning survey and you know there's kind of five non-negotiable questions yeah you can say to it make sure you include X, yeah, okay. um, and do that from there so nice. you can be as incredibly construct well instructive as you want so what i kind of call this here when i share those with people is i call it the minimal prompt framework because oh, it's like okay. how do i move in a couple of minutes from nothing to something mm. and then start to build it from there you'll see some stuff online which i call monster prompts where you go on and someone's <laughs> written like a page of stuff and i'm just like who why you know you can do that but it's like there's so much thinking behind that to do uh. it and i think how can i at least if i'm trying to do idea generation i just kind of want to do something where i can move fast mm -hmm. and then maybe i can do more of that and, and be what, more agile with it as well because exactly, you think yeah, you might yeah. change as you go through it exactly yeah, have a conversation it. you know when it comes back with something you can then say okay what if we tried this and i do it a lot of times like some of the videos i've shared online where it comes back with something i'm like okay that line's interesting let's take that line and do mm. something with it and let's expand upon it mm. although we might change gears i might go okay this is all rubbish let's start again you know here's something so i do it that way rather than the monster prompts because again mm. i go back to the analogy of if you're speaking to someone else if you gave them like a two-page document mm. you're gonna this, switch them off aren't yeah. you? also i do yeah. i do think someone new to ai mm. and, and new to generative and we'll we, we'll wrap up pretty soon because this is really really helpful but just somebody i think who'd be watching this thinking how do i use this mm. is probably used to using google yes. and i don't mm. think you don't put monster prompts into google so if anything no. i think what's really useful that i can see here just to consolidate some of this is that you're putting more in than you would mm. put in into google mm. which actually i don't think erica and i we haven't really done that yet have mm. we we haven't really kind of built in these constraints that's really mm. helpful it's a and really good build on the podcast series that is it yeah. is and being really specific as well about how you want it presented back to you we haven't been doing mm. that either have we we've been doing a bit of paraphrase mm. this or mm -hmm. summarize this mm. but um so that's this actually nice. a really nice build on the kind of people that are likely to be transitioning from google to chat gpt 100 and 100%. building on what yeah. they're asking it to do. So. Ross, yeah. I'm, I'm itching to see what it comes up with. Yeah, I know. Yeah, so let's see what it does. Let's see what it does. Yeah. So I think constraints uh, <laughs> is where it says go away. Um, yeah. The key in anything, really. If you don't give it constraints, then it um, it doesn't work very well. So that you can see it's, it's quite structured already when it comes mm. back. Yeah, it's great. You were like me, Eric. I was like, just press the thing. I'm just like so curious about this stuff. <laughs> it's just, it's brilliant. And then already, so, you know, you've got. Oh, look, it gives you some answers, option scoring, not at all, mm. slightly, somewhat, very mm. much, completely. And what I like as well is like it even gives you recommendations. So it says here, you know, I recommend including both quantitative oh, yeah. and qualitative mm. questions. So it's, it's trying to help you and think about, you know, mm. what might that next prompt be? And that's because, you know, obviously large language models, the funny thing is they're reading all the data, but what they're trying to do, they're trying to guess what the next word will be they're trying to guess what the next kind of ask will be so oh. it's already trying to set you up so it kind of gives you some stuff here to think about you know what could i ask next if i needed to mm -hmm. and i love here where it's already saying you know don't make it too long because mm -hmm. it leads to survey fatigue and make it easy to understand <laughs> so it's all like hey you know don't don't torture people and do that but you know you can see through here look it's giving you 10 questions so depending upon 
you know, what you want to do. You could take those offline. You can work with those or you can just, you know, continue to work with the tool. You could just say, oh. this is great. Let's cut it down to five. So we could just say, this is great stuff. And they were like, why are you praising me? Don't really ever do that. <laughs> You're like, because I can't help it. Exactly. It's too nice. Yeah. It's like, you never nice. praise me when we're on our own. Why are you praising yeah, me? Yeah, you're things? just doing it because you're in front of other um, people. <laughs> exactly. Can you cut these down to the best five? And then, it, yeah, it would just, there you go. Look, this is where that thought back. partner, that bouncing these yeah. ideas yeah. comes yeah. in, isn't yeah. it? And so this is Ross, the thing. We, we don't want you to give all of your secrets away because we know you've got a fantastic <laughs> online it, yeah. course um, and your um, your report has mm. really pulled out some great mm. themes. So where can people find your report? Because I'm sure this is going to drive much more curiosity. Specifically, remind me of the framework again. It was specificity. Yeah, so specificity, context. Context. And constraints yeah Brilliant. so in terms of the report you can there's a number of ways you can do that so i'm going to be cheeky here in terms of promoting myself so go for it it's on my newsletter um so you can sign up to my newsletter at still these com. and in terms of the report itself i am looking right now but if i can't remember i'll send you the link it's something like <laughs> still these faults ai reports but it's all over my linkedin at the moment in time so there is a yeah. um link there too but yeah you can go to still these com slash ai and lnd report 2023 and that will be there as well but it'll be on the newsletter for a, a long time and anything mm -hmm. that's on still these com from ai it will be tagged in there as well mm -hmm. um yeah so you can get all of that there it's all free so you can take it do what you want of it you know um tag us in let us know what you're doing of it i'm just quite intrigued to see what people do Awesome. Brilliant. And your course as well is available also on the website? Yeah, so you just go to stillthesefaults.com again, uh, courses at the top or stillthesefaults.com slash courses. I have a crash course for LND pros just talking about how can you use chat GPT. Um, there's a little community in there as well if you want to join. So we've had like, I think it's like, like 50 people already in the last few weeks have joined us. Um, it's self-paced. So yes, you will see me. I won't physically be there. It'll be the matrix version of me. So enjoy that. <laughs> um, but yeah, again, that's all built from the fact that it's just trying to give people information that's really specific to our industry instead of, um, you know, the 19 year old gurus that I see on Twitter and LinkedIn talking about making where it is a thousand pounds a thousand dollars an hour yeah. using <laughs> I mean, that's crazy AI. like i just think yeah. if it's really doing that do you think i'd be doing all this stuff yeah. I know, right? like, do you know what i mean it's like why are you giving me this video for free of course you're not yeah. going to be making a thousand yeah. pound a day it's so funny but yeah and if people want to connect with you ross finally best way to connect with you directly yeah, linkedin i i yeah i'm only i only live on linkedin so that's the only social i have or still these and mm -hmm. like i say that's all free library of stuff there you can get me there as well but uh yeah linkedin is the best place to um try and get me Amazing. Brilliant. Thank you so Thanks much. Thank us. you for sharing right. this framework. Great I stuff. think this is really practical and lots of awesome extra builds and, and information that people can cool. go and access as well. So thank Lovely. you so right. much. Have a good one. Thanks for us. Have a good day.